So digital poverty is very much a growing problem. And I think for all of us, um, we were perhaps aware of it beforehand, but the pandemic has really exposed this as a really significant issue. Um, and that a significant proportion of the UK are digitally excluded for even not having internet access or really low levels of digital literacy. And I hope that during today's conversation, we'll explore a little further what digital poverty is, what the role of libraries is in combating this and how we collectively can also respond. So I'm really looking forward to this and also looking forward to not just hearing from the panel, but also having your contributions and hearing from you. And thinking around about digital poverty, I really like the Office of Students definition um, and it really chimes with me when I'm thinking around about it. Um, and it's definition is that a student is suffering from digital poverty if they do not have access to appropriate hardware, software, reliable access to the internet, technical support, a trained teacher or instructor or access to skills development and an appropriate study space. And while perhaps not all of that um, chimes the same for all the different communities we are involved in, I think we can really relate to all those different elements when we're thinking around about digital poverty and what that means. Um, and again, recent studies have shown that there are really significant proportions of the population lacking internet access. And I think even more interesting is the low levels of digital literacy. Um, and the pandemic has just exacerbated this as we all were suddenly thrown to working from home and having not just ourselves working from home, but children and students learning from home. And that sort of realization that many students, I think around about 70% of students do not have laptops. And I suppose that's why we're having this conversation now. And I think it must be really frustrating for many people who've been really trying to champion this issue that we are only now having such a sharp focus and lens on it. And I think that's because we've all lived through this experience recently and all are beginning to understand what this actually means. And I think it's also been exacerbated over the last few years with a digital shift in many public services. And this digital by default, which assumes internet access, assumes that there is digital literacy, and again, by digital literacy, I'm referring to something which is more than just knowing about how to use certain software products, but is really a way of thinking and mastering and how we use these different digital interfaces. So I think, as I would sort of acknowledge, access to broadband and equipment are key, but it is also the digital skills and literacy and how that affects people that is so significant. And we've all experienced this now. We've all seen what it means to be digitally poor as we've all helped our staff set up and work from home. And we suddenly discovered not everyone had appropriate broadband, had the right equipment. Um, and it's made us really appreciate what, what impact this can actually have. So if I could ask Sue to introduce yourself. Hi everybody, um, I'm Sue Williamson. I'm the National Director for Public Libraries for Arts Council England, which is the National Development Agency for Public Libraries. My interest is in promoting partnerships with public libraries to use the power of that network and the expertise of trained public library staff to deliver solutions and programmes. During lockdown, the severity of the issue concerning digital poverty was highlighted and I see a fantastic role for public libraries in helping to address this. Thank you. Now Catherine, would you like to introduce yourself please? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Catherine Mills and I'm Head of Digital Social Inclusion for Good Things Foundation. So if you don't know who we are, we are a social change charity and we operate both in the UK and Australia. Uh, we have a vision uh, with a world that where everyone benefits from digital. We actually lead a network of thousands of community organisations, which include public libraries, as well as um, voluntary sector organisations, uh, social housing, those kind of organisations too. And we have a network that operates both across both countries. And this network is about how we can focus on helping people to access and use the internet to have better lives. 
Our model is based on embedding and supporting digital inclusion within the critical work that already happens in the community sector at the front line. So that could be helping people find employment, improve their health or manage money. And over this last year, we have seen um, it's something that we've been working on for a long time, but we've obviously seen a massive uh, interest and increase in the need to start looking at digital poverty. Thank you. And next, can I come to Trevor? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Trevor Dawes at the, the Vice Provost for Libraries and Museums and University Librarian at the University of Delaware in the United States. Um, at the University of Delaware, we have been keenly interested in um, increasing the population of first generation students and students from lower socioeconomic status at our campus. And um, these students are often associated with a uh, lack of appropriate access to technological and internet resources. And as has everyone uh, already noted, we've certainly seen an increase, an exacerbation of this problem um, during the, the last 15 months at the, with the pandemic. Um, we also at the university have been um, including a lot of uh, multimedia components in a lot of our classes. And so certainly within the library, uh, we have been instrumental, I believe, in providing access not only to the equipment, but also the relevant instruction um, that goes with uh, helping not just the students, but also some of our faculty members um, in building those multimedia components in their teaching and learning. Thank you. Um, and now can I go to Joe, please? Um, good morning or good afternoon, as it were. I am Joe Lucia. I'm the Dean of Libraries at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the United States. And um, Temple is, we like to call it the public university of the city of Philadelphia. And uh, we are located um, geographically in the city uh, in a relatively impoverished neighborhood um, with a very large um, African-American um, and uh, Latinx community uh, that uh, historically has been significantly underserved in a number of different areas, um, and particularly by the free library, just because of the way the geography, the branches work. So, we have had a historical commitment in the libraries and as an institution to um, be an ally and a, a provider of uh, support where possible to that community. So um, for many years, we've run a public computing lab uh, for our neighborhood in our um, physical facilities. Um, so that's kind of the history. Uh, we also learned, you know, as the pandemic shutdown emerged that um, as, as an access institution, because um, we have a very significant population of um, first generation university students, that many of our students had technological needs they couldn't easily meet when we went remote. And so we mobilized with our IT folks to provide a very large number of laptops from our from our loaner pool to to um, put them out in the community, um, and and uh, again um, kept our building open uh, against uh, you know a lot of resistance because a lot of our students who live in Philadelphia did not have access to Wi-Fi at home. So there's a range of issues where we've been involved with uh, these questions, both longer term and um, in the immediate past. Thank you very much, Joe. And Hannah. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Holmes. I'm a research associate at the Cambridge Centre for Housing and Planning Research, which is part of the Department of Land Economy at Cambridge University. Um, and my research is largely focused around social inequalities and marginality. Um, and in the past few years, my work with CCHPR has expanded to include digital poverty as part of that. So the centre's work has looked specifically at digital exclusion as a facet of poverty more broadly and its relationship to other forms of deprivation. And in our most recent work, we're considering the importance of digital inclusion for managing money and finding work amongst people who are experiencing poverty and establishing how digital exclusion fits into the context of people's lives in a, a sort of more broad way. Thank you for that. 
And last, but by absolutely no means least, Christopher. Hi there, thanks very much. Um, my name's Chris Hale. I'm the Director of Policy at Universities UK. And for those of you, of you who don't know, Universities UK is the representative body for all of the universities in the UK across England, Scotland, Wales and, and Northern Ireland. We have about 140 members and they're made up of the executive heads, vice chancellors, principals of, of those universities. I mean, we've had a key focus as Universities UK as a national organisation supporting our members through the, through the pandemic and, and particularly that shift to online and what that has, has meant. And a key aspect of that has been the question of digital poverty and how we support um, uh, disadvantaged students as well. And we've worked very closely with JISC, which um, is the sort of UK's higher education technology body, but also with the Office for Students, which is the regulator, to really sort of try and understand and explore what some of those issues and challenges are understand that shift, understand from a policy perspective what, what needs to be done, um, and also how, it, how the questions that are arising and becoming more pertinent around um, digital poverty relate to some of those questions that universities have been dealing with for a very long time around social mobility, access, inclusion, participation, and those kind of things. Thank you very much. And then last but not least, for those who don't know you, I'm Kirsty Lingstadt. I'm Head of the Dig Digital Library and Deputy Director of the Library at University of Edinburgh. And you may have noticed that my co-convener, um, Michelle Blake, is not joining us today. And she's unfortunately um, been laid low um, and isn't able to come. But I'm sure she'll be listening um, from her sick bed and um, cheering us on from the sidelines. So thanks very much for those introductions and also placing into context uh, where each of you are coming from. And I suppose thinking very much around about digital poverty and the fact that really it has been a long-standing societal challenge. I just want to ask about this major challenge that we're facing and to sort of start the discussion um, and ask in particular Catherine and then moving on to Hannah, how would you characterize the nature and extent of this challenge? And how is it really manifest amongst individuals, but also amongst particular communities? So Catherine, if you would maybe like to pick up on that aspect. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty. So I just wanted to start by unpicking, I know very helpfully you put in your um, introduction, Kirsty, sort of the explanation of digital poverty, but I thought I might do it just from our perspective in the community side. And at Good Things, we've uh, put together what we call a digital exclusion pyramid, which looks at the what we consider the four key blocks of digital exclusion. And firstly, it starts at the bottom with devices. What we saw through the pandemic was that if you didn't have access to a device, you were essentially cut off. And it's something that we will hold our hands up at Good Things because, because we'd had this network of organizations, we'd always focused very much on basic skills, thinking that the device and the access to, um, to that technology was happening through libraries, it was happening through to community organizations. And in that first pandemic, in that first lockdown, when pretty much everything closed their doors, suddenly lots of people who were who reliant on those um, devices were locked out. And so we realized very quickly that we had to do something about it. So for us, that forms the, the pillar that if you don't have that access to the device, then you, you're not going to go anywhere. However, once you've got the access, you need to have the connectivity. And data poverty is something that, again, has been around a long time, but has really risen in significance. And, and you hear lots of people now starting to talk about data poverty. Interestingly, again, that's one of those words or one of those terms that has lots of different meanings. So for us at Good Things, data poverty is the inability to afford sufficient, private, secure internet connection to meet your essential needs. Um, Data poverty means you're not going to be able to live well in a digital society. You know, you can't apply for jobs online, banks, all your essential services, and you obviously can't keep in touch with people. You know, it leaves communities behind. So you need to have the devices and the data poverty uh, and the connection to go together. Sort of in the middle bit of our pyramid is the basic digital skills. And by that, we're not talking about all the key skills that you might need in employment and jobs. This is about the, the, the essential skills you need just to access 
um, essential critical services. So we use the government's essential digital framework and the five key areas that we mean by data, data, basic digital skills is the ability to communicate, to email, to go on social media, to share online, to handle information and content. You know, so many people don't really understand where their information is coming from. Transacting online, how can you do transactions safely online? Shopping, universal credit, your health information. Problem solving, how do you find information to help you solve your problems? Um, and then wrapped around that um, is how do you stay safe online? You know, keeping your information um, legal and confidential. And one of the things that we've been also thinking about is it's implied consent. How do we get people to recognize when they are giving away essential information that they don't realize that they are, you know, that there's a lot going on in that online safety. And again, we saw through the pandemic, the increase in online scams um, and all of those targeting some of the more vulnerable people who were going online first off. And then finally, in our digital pyramid at the top is personal motivation, because you can give all of those three things, but actually if the person hasn't got a reason to engage and digitally, then they'll still say it's not for me or I'll get my daughter or my children to do it. So for us, it is about, you have to tackle all those four components when you're looking at this issue. Tackling one is not going to get you, it'll get you so far, but it won't really look at you know solving this problem. So in terms of the other bit, I just wanted to quickly cover in this bit is the scale of the issue, which I think is really useful just to have as context. And very helpfully, last uh, week, the Lloyds Banking Group in the UK do a, a consumer digital index, which takes a snapshot of where we are each year in terms of our digital um, uh, engagement. Um, and for 2021, these are the, just a quick key of some of the things they found. So 14.9 million people in this country still have very low digital engagement. And these, so these are people who are online, but what we call limited users. So by that, we mean young people normally who have no or few qualifications who are only using the internet for social media or entertainment. Um, many limited users only have a smartphone. And again, this, is, this can really affect critical engagement. There's only a very limited amount that you can do if you only have a smartphone as your only access to the internet. And many of these limited users don't have the digital skills needed for work. What we have seen through the pandemic is that that level of digital skills you needed to operate to work has increased. And we saw this at Good Things. We have a platform called Learn My Way, where we normally aimed at people who are new to digital skills, it takes them on that journey. We suddenly saw an influx of people who were on furlough or who were worried about their employment during that first lockdown because they suddenly realized they didn't have the digital skills needed for work now that they were having to work either remotely or in a different way. And we really saw that influx that people going, my digital skills are just no longer good enough. I think very worryingly, what Lloyd's found was that 2.6 million people are still completely offline. Um, and 39% of them are under 60. So this busts this idea, because I, I don't know about other people, but I get told a lot that, you know, this is an older, this is for older people, older people don't want to engage. This is just not true. And this is what this is showing. One of the interesting things I think about this is that digital inclusion is not a fixed state. So people can fluctuate, they, they go, you know, sometimes, especially when it comes to connectivity and data poverty, it's a fluctuation. Sometimes if you have the money, you can be included, you've got enough money to buy your connections, you're, you, you know, and you have the, the right device and you've got the skills. But if you actually, and we found this a lot through communities telling us, people saying, I had to choose between either I bought food for the table or I bought data for my children, either to do homeschooling or to connect connections. These are the choices. It's, it's no longer a nice to have. This is essential. Um, and, you know, so I think it, it does show. And again, Lloyd's are saying that data and device affordability is a real issue with 31 percent of people saying that if they could have cheaper mobile data, that would get them more online. And finally, I just want to finish by saying what else the Lloyd's pulled out was that um, people with disabilities and impairments are still being left behind as well. 
So they also were finding through this year, the number of people using assisted tech has fallen over the past year. And this is really concerning um, because it means they may not be able to get online as easily. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of, of the picture I had. So, no, that's been fantastic. And I think that sort of filled out some of those sort of other elements um, and sort of really highlighted sort of some key components of what we mean when we sort of talk about digital poverty as well. So thanks very much for that, Catherine. And I suppose I was going to go to you, Hannah. You've done a lot of work in this area. Um, would you like to pick up with this particular question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll build upon what Catherine's mentioned about the relationship between digital exclusion and poverty. Um, so it's increasingly recognised that digital poverty should be considered as one aspect of poverty and social exclusion more broadly, and um, in that it both contributes to and is exacerbated by the inequality and the poverty that already exists in the UK and beyond. Um, so low income households are far less likely to have access to the internet and to suitable devices and skills than their higher income counterparts. Um, so data from 2014, which I think is provided by the ONS, um, shows that only 51% of households in Scotland who earned annually between six and 10,000 pounds had access to home internet, compared with 99% of households um, which earned over 40,000 pounds a year. So I think the link between poverty and digital exclusion is very clear. And digital poverty itself then is a, a key characteristic of poverty in the 21st century in the UK. Um, and therefore, I think digital exclusion is something that can't be solved on its own and tackling poverty as a root cause is a really important part of that. Um, and then in terms of how digital poverty is manifested among individuals and communities, uh, my research with people who are um, taking part in a coaching program, which aims to help people get into work, manage their money and get online. Uh, it shows that not being, on, being able to get online is very closely related to the other aspects of deprivation that people are experiencing. And it's manifested in having seriously reduced access to job opportunities, um, not only because of, obviously there's a, an increasing need for digital skills in work um, in many jobs, but also because access to online job applications is limited if you don't have a good internet connection, um, a suitable device or the skills that you need to be able to sign up for an account on a job site and, and then write and upload a CV on the computer and then monitor that account for any updates. Um, and it also makes managing money more difficult uh, if you can't check your bank balance, for example, without physically getting on a bus to go to a bank or to, an, uh, to the ATM. Um, and then you can't compare deals online. So you might end up paying more for something um, when you're already on a tight budget. Um, and often people who are digitally excluded often do end up um, relying on expensive pay-as-you-go data rather than on broadband contracts, um, perhaps because someone might have unreliable monthly income and they might not be able to sort of commit to saying they'll pay, pay out, out a contract every month. Um, or people might have debts or a poor credit rating and therefore some providers won't actually accept the custom. Um, and then some people might just be unaware as well of the different options that are available out there because they can't get online to check. Um, so I spoke to one person during my research who was paying £70 a month for data on his phone, which was a lot more data than he actually needed, just because he hadn't known how much he would need when he signed up for it. And there was no information that he could access that would, that would tell him that information. Um, so I think it's fair to summarise then that digital poverty is a problem which is closely related and closely maps onto poverty more broadly. Um, and it's obviously got several well-documented implications. Um, essentially making life more difficult for people who are already struggling with poverty. Thanks for that, Hannah. And just sort of thinking around about what both uh, Catherine and Hannah, you've been talking about there, I wonder if I could just bring Sue in for a minute, um, because Catherine, you mentioned that role of libraries and public libraries and that assumption that if people didn't have devices, they might be going to libraries or other sort of places and spaces to get that sort of access. And I don't know, Sue, if you want to kind of hop in and maybe just sort of pull on this a bit, because I think it also ties in with that sort of skills piece that both of you have sort of mentioned and, and talked about. Sue. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to talk to this when we come to my bit a little bit as well. But I mean, just to say there are over 3000 libraries in England alone, and they're right in the heart of their communities. And they've had free internet access for over 20 years for anybody. So you don't need your own device. But if you do have your own device, 
Um, they have Wi-Fi access as well. 99% of libraries in England have Wi-Fi access. And um, they also have trained staff on hand to help people with any queries or questions. And I, I mean, I've worked in a, in a pub before, before this job, I've worked in a library. You know, you get people coming in saying, what does that a sign mean with the squiggle over the top and and can you show me how to set up an email account it's that level when when Catherine was talking about lack of internet skills it's that kind of level um and, and one thing I would say actually is that during the pandemic um, public libraries were designated as essential services precisely because they could provide that digital access so if you you could have you, you could during lockdown book a PC in a public library and go in and spend you know book an hour's slot and go in and do whatever you needed to do um, you know make a job application look at the the health services online whatever you needed to do so yeah I mean they're, they're an essential service in this Absolutely. And thinking a bit more round about this, I suppose we've spoken a lot about the sort of broader aspects, but I suppose thinking around about students, students are living in communities, students were quite often um, sent home during this particular period um, and were therefore much more embedded in their communities, but also sometimes still living within the, the university environment. So Christopher, do you want to just perhaps pull out some of the elements and aspects there that students were particularly grappling with? Yeah, thanks, Kirsty, and thank you for those um, overviews um, from Hannah and Kathleen. Really, really useful framing. I mean, obviously, as as we've heard, access to equipment and connections are are pretty critical and that's absolutely critical to learning. And there is, from the evidence we've looked at, there is a quite a good correlation between those students from disadvantaged backgrounds and and digital poverty. And that's something we see in in higher education. And I think it's I think the good news is that universities have been quite well placed to respond. And, and part of the good news is that we, we kind of broadly know who those students are. And over time, because of that correlation, we've, we've done a lot of work to be able to identify who those students are and, and a lot of support around bursaries, um, around equipment, around connection, dongles, all that kind of stuff has been, has been put in place during the, during the pandemic. And that work builds on that work that universities have done to support those students. Um, and we have seen increasing demand and we've seen increasing demand and um, uh, stretch for those sort of hardship funds and the bursaries that are available. I, I guess the point I'd like to make, however, is I think it's quite important we don't just look at that digital poverty question. And this is something that's really come to our mind thinking about universities and students as an absolute thing that is strictly correlated to how we think about poverty and disadvantage, particularly in relation to students and and indeed, I guess, society more widely in a, in a sort of traditional sense. And, and I think there's a number of challenges which have come up in terms of thinking about students. One, one is concern that was expressed for students with family income, who in most cases don't qualify for support. You know, they're not registered as students don't have a track record of free school meals. They're not sort of registered and recorded as disadvantaged students. But, you know, we've seen during the period of the pandemic change in their family circumstances, which is potentially brought them into into challenge so I think there's there's um, an issue there which I think uh, universities have had to grapple with in terms of identifying those students I think some students have struggled with poor wi-fi connections and um, and we've often seen those students not being perhaps the students that you think they they might be um, you know because of the context in which they are um, living or, or, or studying and the JISC um, report um, showed that 62% of students um, highlight an impact on their learning of slow slow Wi-Fi and slow connection so that's that's a wider group of students and those universities might be traditionally targeted in relation to um, a disadvantage and often those students are living in shared accommodation might be at home um, might be at halls or in rural areas for example where they're connectivity might might be poor or, or might be might be weak and I think that um, sort of adds additional cost pressures to those students as well and added stress and does sort of jeopardize their their, their learning potentially again so and as I say it's not necessarily sometimes those students that have been identified and targeted for for support and I think there's also a question of staff as well and often um, uh, you know, I think there's assumption, obviously, because staff in universities, you know, in most cases, um, probably are regarded as having a, you know, not being disadvantaged. But 
I think some of the circumstances that staff have, have lived in and you know have had challenges around connectivity. I mean, I'm a school governor and, and it's actually an issue which came up in terms of teaching staff. Um, you know, you may not regard those teaching staff being in sort of poverty or dis necessarily disadvantaged, but, but in terms of digital connectivity, some of them had real challenges in terms of their you know their personal circumstances and the environments they were living in and those kind of things and also just being able to get good good connection um and then i think um you know i think it's been raised already as well and it was raised in your opening points kirsty about the sort of thinking about the context and where people are living um and, and actually just having the space it's one thing you may have good connection good connectivity but working and, and learning remotely can be a challenge and having the space to do that you know where it's quiet um, and you've got the space to be able to study and, and be able to do what you need to do is, is really important um, and then I think another issue which has come up which is one that um, has been raised already is that sort of capacity to learn um, digitally and and so and, and I think there's often a generational issue here I think people often assume you know people of certain generation of digital natives they, could, they live online, but, but actually learning online and having the capabilities to learn through digital sources, I think uh, is a challenge. And that's something that needs to be learned in itself and supported quite closely. So I think there's a potential area where digital poverty can manifest itself in, in that regard. Um, so I think there's, there's lots of ongoing support that's needed, particularly for those people who are from social, poor or social economic backgrounds more disadvantaged backgrounds, but I think there's also this wider set of issues that sit around those people as well that I think we've got to make sure we're we're understanding and engaging with as well. No, and I think what you were just talking about there really chimes, you know, having kids at home who are trying to learn and, and do online learning, that's actually quite different from being in the classroom and talking to student staff um, that I've been working with here at the university. Again, some of them were just finding they were struggling because it is they are familiar with it, but there are additional skills, especially when you're doing it for prolonged periods of time. And I was just wondering, um, from the sort of US perspective, is there anything that you, Trevor or Joe, would like to kind of chime in with at this particular point in time? So I would, um, I, I do appreciate um, the framing also that Catherine and Hannah provided and, and particularly the pyramid model about which uh, Catherine spoke. I think we've been, um, certainly at, at our university, we've been sort of focusing on, on the first three components of the pyramid as you described them, the equipment, the access and and the skills. And what we haven't been focusing on is that personal motivation piece. And I think that's really critical for us um, in order for these skills to be really internalized so that they can be lifelong uh, skills for our students and, and faculty uh, across, the, across the university. So thank you for that framing. And I think it'll, it'll help us as we think about how we continue to use our and do our instruction. Thanks for that. Joe? Uh, yes, and I'll, I'll just say again, to echo that point, I, I think what's really um, uh, telling here is the, um, the real congruence uh, across, you know, um, our kind of national boundaries uh, around um, the shape of these issues and how they're experienced. And um, I, I think uh, one of our challenges in, in the US, and this is a broad challenge, it's not just related to digital poverty, is that we're, we're not really very effective as a country in mobilizing at a national policy level. And many of these things um, really do require kind of a coherent shared vision of what we wish to accomplish. So we do a lot of things um, in, in highly localized settings and you know um, across, you might say professional cultures, but without a large systematic, uh, often um, unified framework. So, you know, to be, you know, specific in terms of, you know, the, the kinds of things Trevor mentioned, again, we're committed in, in those areas as well in serving our community, but the work we're doing is not always integrated with a broader set of programs, um, let's say in the city, although I don't wanna um, underplay the fact that, this, that our city government 
has recognized these issues and is trying to do some things more systematically within the city of Philadelphia. And uh, we are involved in some of those. And I'll probably talk about a few of those a bit later. Right. So thanks for that. And we've got a couple of hands up. So Sue, you first, um, and then we'll come to Catherine. Um, thanks, Kirsty. Um, I just just I've been following the chat actually, and I think I probably just need to clarify something. A lot of people have been saying that their local library wasn't open. Um, a group of key stakeholders have been having weekly conversations with government and out of those conversations um, we produced a toolkit so that libraries could reopen safely which have, has been really sort of useful in all the stages of lockdown and what government said was that libraries could open they were they were allowed to open for four essential services of one of which one was being able to book pcs the decision on whether to open the local public library rested entirely with the local authority it wasn't mandatory so i i, I thought i'd better just say that i'd also just like to say that i think joe made a brilliant point there that actually this is this is something that needs national programming national solution finding in order to address and possibly finally just to say as a student who when I went through university I didn't even have a typewriter I wrote everything by hand I'm currently doing a course actually and I'm finding it really difficult even though I use technology every day to understand what how students work on a regular basis um, to study using digital technology all the time very different from any experience of learning I've ever had. Catherine? Thanks. Uh, I suppose just listening to, um, sorry, see, I can't even raise and lower my hand properly. Um, so <laughs> I, I suppose I just wanted to put back a little bit of a challenge as well um, to everyone and to the community, because one of the things we've been looking at is um, digital ecosystems. And obviously a university or a research library is part of that community. And to think through that halo effect that you can have. So it isn't just thinking about the students as well as, and I know when we've, you know, I, I know, uh, I think Joe and others have said about the staff, but one of the challenges that we always put when we work with organizations is, is every single member of your staff. And when I see that, I mean, are all your cleaning staff, your property maintenance staff, staff who perhaps digital isn't part of their job, but actually as, as part of being part of those communities and part of an academic community, do we not have a responsibility to ensure that all members of staff are digitally engaged? And actually, if you think through, they are then going back into their communities and, you know, we're talking about students and others working and being environments where those digital skills are perhaps not there. There is a halo effect. And so I, I do, I would like to broaden out our thinking, really. And it's a challenge that I give to everyone that I do, it's local government and all sorts, is let's really broaden out who, when we say about who needs digital skills, it's really making sure that everybody who we work with and engage with has an opportunity to, to get those digital skills. Thank you for that, Catherine. And I think, again, that sort of challenge and that question around about, you know, what scope is there for the civic university to sort of start addressing digital poverty is a really key thing. And I'll sort of pose that question, which has come from the audience from Joe Webb, and can I also hand over to Christopher, who I think wants to come in at those questions. Should I go first? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's, uh, I, Catherine, I think that's a great, um, a great challenge. I was going to pick up on the point uh, Kirsty did about the civic university and that civic role. And I think that's something that's really getting momentum in the UK at the moment is this idea about how universities can support the communities in which they are they are rooted. And, and um, we're already seeing some of that. I think that sort of supporting digital poverty is, is a really important dimension that. And we're seeing, I mean, I was quite struck yesterday. I think JISC um, wrote a letter to um, or put the minister to write a letter to local authorities saying, can you um, uh, extend the access that they provide from in universities, Edurom basically, which is the sort of university Wi-Fi system to local authorities so it could be made available more widely within the community. And I think that's a great um, example of how the sort of capacity and capability within the university sector can really help that civic role. The other thing I wanted to say, and the reason I put my, my hand up as well, is that whilst we're talking about um, digital poverty, there's an interesting contradiction emerging, which I think we should 
perhaps think about in our discussion and and certainly the evidence that we're developing and the discussions we're having with the sector shows that the shift to online and the shift that universities have made okay it's been quite a steep learning curve but a lot of universities have got it right has actually led to um, better attainment and better outcomes and also a narrowing of the attainment gap particularly between more advantaged and disadvantaged students um, so there must be something there that, that is worth sort of looking at and exploring and building upon. Um, I mean, yes, I think we do need to be focusing on this question around digital poverty, but it feels like universities have done sort of quite a good job in, in maintaining that sort of quality of provision and also narrowing those gaps. So um, I'm just interested in other people's thoughts on, on what might be causing that. Now, some of that might be there is no detriment policies, um, and some of the assessments that would have taken place didn't take place and those kind of things. But I don't think that completely explains the narrowing of those gaps. Things we're seeing is that people are more engaged and more likely to get engaged, particularly those people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and there's lots more opportunities for them to get engaged. And I wonder whether sort of continuing to support that, um, uh, that capability and their ability to get online could actually lead to some quite significant sort of changes in terms of the outcomes for those students. Thank you for that, Christopher. And now Lisa, who's been patiently um, waiting, um, do you want to join the panel and ask your question, please? Uh, sure. Um, I, I'm sorry, there is building work happening. So if uh, I might, you might hear some drilling. Um, I'm, I just wanted to know, have you, in, have any of you in your research Oh, by the way, I'm really pleased to see our US colleagues here. So nice to see you guys. Um, have any of our uh, panelists found that there are any similarities between the ways that um, people have been excluded from, um, from access to, for example, uh, sports facilities and the way that people are excluded from um, digitally enabled facilities? Um, are there, you know, I'm just wondering about larger patterns in our communities where you can see that, um, I know we're talking about people who experience, you know, financial deprivation, but that larger pattern of really how people are actually alienated in their local communities. Uh, just, we're in, a, we're in an economy that's a global economy, but nobody's given global citizenship. And all of our investments are for, you um, for global firms that don't need to invest in a local community. And so we find, and that's happening in the UK and it has always been the case in the US. Um, so I just wonder if, if there are other patterns and maybe if actually there are opportunities then for us to address broader issues in our local communities because we can see that, that the digital divide is actually a, uh, one of many, and maybe addressing those divides can happen in a more uh, organized, coherent response. Thank you for that, Lisa. I wonder whether perhaps Hannah, would you like to pick up on that first? Yeah, can I find my unmute button? Um, yeah, yeah, I think certainly it is obviously a broader it's, it's an aspect of broader exclusion um so um the research that i'm doing at the moment i haven't i haven't finished it but i am finding that people who are generally excluded from broader societal um activities um perhaps people um a lot of people with mental health conditions that are potentially excluded from um from various different activities as a result of that as well um it's, I suppose it's sort of a, a broader issue that can't be tackled on its own because it because it's linked more broadly to poverty. Um, I saw somebody put in the the chat about the retrench, retrenchment of um of the welfare state um, and and of closure of sort of public facilities as part of austerity, um, which is obviously all, all a key part of it. Um, and I think it goes back to what Catherine said. Obviously, being online is now an essential. Uh, it's not something that is a kind of um, a luxury. It's something that's essential. And therefore, if people who are on low incomes, um, perhaps on universal credit, um, are not able to afford access through the income that, that they have, um, 
that's then obviously it's not giving people the opportunities to then to to get online and, and to engage in society in the way that um in the way that they should be able to with that welfare support I suppose that's a a link to a broader issue there Thanks so much for that, Hannah. I don't know, do any of our other panellists want to pick up on those particular comments that Lisa made and, and kind of add to Hannah's feedback there? I, mean, I, I, could I come in on that? I, I mean, I come back to the point I made earlier about that civic role of universities. I think, I think that's something we can do. I think, um, I don't think you can sort of look to universities to replace the sort of the state and, and that sort of welfare state role. But I think there's a lot of things that universities are doing in, in their communities. You mentioned sports facilities, I think, um, in the question. And I think um, universities will have quite, well, most universities will have open access policies around their, their facilities. And, and uh, camp campuses are quite permeable these days in terms of the local communities and they'll provide you know, support for all sorts of groups and societies that are outside of the sort of students, uh, uh, as well as as well as the sort of example I gave earlier around um, uh, around sort of providing Wi-Fi and access to to connectivity where they can. And Catherine, you've got your think, hand raised. Uh, yeah, I think Joe's had his hand up longer than me. Ooh, Just... Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't see it there. My apologies, Joe. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was going to wait until you called on me, so um, I appreciate that. I do. I want to. This actually follows on a couple of different comments, but it was really uh, triggered by um, the you know the reflections on the halo effect of of universities. And I'm thinking, you know, we have um, a scope of resources and a scale of um, social capital and relationships that'll allow us to do certain things, and. I, um, and I'm, I'm not trying to say, oh, so let me tell you about great things we're doing at my institution, but we have a program that's evolving right now that's not fully implemented that I think is an interesting example of, of the halo effect, which is um, working with the city uh, of Philadelphia Digital Literacy Alliance. We're working to bring um, no cost wireless networking into the surrounding neighborhoods um, by, by um, a collaboration with a um, a point-to-point -point internet provider in the city that provides low-cost internet, um, essentially, you know, uh, antenna-based um, with mesh repeaters. And um, it's a collaborative project that actually has a business model behind it because they will be able, will be able to sell low-cost wireless to our students who live in the surrounding neighborhood and apartments um, of various kinds, but also um, create a, an open a public internet that, you know, to use a phrase one of my colleagues used that kind of reclaims public space by turning local parks and other outdoor spaces into free wireless access points for the city. And also allowing that signal um, to, um, you know, penetrate local buildings and, and be available for home wireless um, for members of our community. So that's a really interesting example that's built around an alliance between the city a business um, and an institutional commitment to be a resource um, in this particular space in in our neighborhood. Um, anyway, that's 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 a just a little local story. Sorry, Catherine, do you want to come in now? Yeah, I, uh, just going back to Lisa's point. Um, so one of the things that the reason that my title is digital social inclusion is because we absolutely recognize what Hannah was saying that um, digital exclusion and social exclusion go hand in hand. And so what we find by working with community organizations and libraries and others working in those trusted spaces where people perhaps aren't presenting with digital inclusion, they're not presenting going, I need digital skills sometimes. What they come in with is, I need help with my universal credit application. I need to help with the job. And we actually then embed those digital skills as we help them to come overcome these challenges, these social issues that they're going through. And so 
Well, and what we find is that by doing that, and it goes back to that personal motivation piece, that people, there is a reason for actually starting to engage. And then we have a theory of change as part of our, our learning. And what we see is, is that no, very few people go on a very linear journey where they start off with, okay, I need to apply for a job. Oh, great. I know how, you know, I'm going to start doing digital skills now. And they carry on until they're digitally included. They will drop on and off. But the benefit of having places like libraries, which I'm sure we'll pick up with, because I know we've got this sort of the next topic and Sue will pick up on this, but having those trusted spaces in communities where people can go and help with, I just need help with an email. They get help with that resolution, but then it's about building that confidence and then they will come back again and again. And it is this sort of how you build these journeys, but it is about addressing some of those social issues alongside digital inclusion there's very few there, there are some people that come in and go i want to learn how to be you know i want to learn digital skills the majority of people and and i do come with um i i was a librarian for 17 years in public library so i have been there i have sat where people have gone you go well you know you just use a mouse well, where where's a mouse you know no no that's the mouse where's the you, you know and you really have to think through your language and everything you, you know you take people on a journey but most of the time it is about addressing some of those social issues and not just digital inclusion on its own. Thank you so much for that Catherine and Trevor you had your hand up there would you just like to come in now? Uh, sure so um, I, I appreciate the question about the broader social aspects and um, you know particularly in the US we've seen a lot of um, not just libraries but um, academic institutions more broadly, and even um, in, in the for-profit and not-for-profit spaces, um, using language around anti-racism uh, right now. And while it's not exactly um, explicitly tied to digital exclusion, um, for us at the University of Delaware, where we have just embarked on an anti-racism audit with a partner institution in Binghamton, and you know, Joe's heard me tell this story before, we are looking at um, uh, all of our practices, our, our talent management practices, our communication services, our digital, our, our everything that we do through an anti-racist um, anti lens. Now, what's the connection between that and digital and digital literacy? So when we when we look at um, everything from, through this through this uh, anti-racist lens, what we're really doing is being more inclusive overall. And the story that I, I use to illustrate this point is one of desegregation in, in the state of Alabama when uh, swimming pools in the state of Alabama were desegregated and um, the white citizens of the state decided to close the public swimming pools, thereby leaving no pools available for anyone to swim in. Not only the black kids' children were excluded, but the white children were also excluded. So by looking at what we do through an anti-racist lens, then it, bring, it lifts everyone up at the same time in all aspects of what we do, including our digital services. So even to go back to, to Catherine's point about, um, you know, I, I do talk a lot about the students because I'm in a higher education library, but yes, we, we do think more broadly, um, more broadly about the, the community, uh, uh, the community at large and partnering with our public libraries and other organizations to really build those skills out um, across. And I think this is um, the, the, the ways in which we have been focusing our, um, our work more most recently, I think is really going to help um, all of us in the end. Thank you very much for that. And I think this is the perfect moment actually to kind of think a little bit more about the role of libraries in combating digital poverty. We've really begun to touch on that and it's been reflected through the questions as well. So I think um, I'd like to ask you, Sue, if you could just highlight a little bit more the role of libraries, um, whether it's public or other, in combating digital poverty. I know you've touched on a couple of things already, but if you could just expand on that, please. Of course. Um, thanks, Kirsty, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been asked to outline the role of public libraries in this debate around digital poverty and some of the things I've already touched on, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it again 
to put it into context and also you know to emphasize it for those people who have come from a long way away and who are maybe not familiar with this with the role of public libraries in england and the rest of the uk so Public libraries have been key players in the UK in preventing digital poverty since the end of the last century when government funded free access to computers in public libraries through the People's Network program, which is now 24 years old. They wanted to ensure that access to technology wasn't limited solely to those who could afford both connectivity and the then very expensive devices to access increasing technological developments. Then bearing in mind that even to self-build a computer in those days cost about 1300 pounds. So it was, it was you know, without that network, it was limited to very few people. More recently, government also funded Wi-Fi in public libraries to support those um, with the necessary devices who were maybe on the move or without decent broadband, or perhaps, as we've touched on, the wherewithal to fund that connectivity in their homes. And that's what digital poverty is all about. It's there, but I can't afford it. And there's been a big, a, a huge debate over lockdown about sort of bringing digital connectivity into the realm of other, other utilities like electricity electricity, gas, um, and everything that makes you, water, everything that makes you able to live comfortably in your own home in the 21st century. So it's worth reflecting at this point that access to computers and to, in fact to all e-resources through the public library network in the UK is entirely free at the point of contact. And it's also useful to think back to that initial vision and how far we've come in terms of that shift to digital in the intervening 20 years and the acceleration of that shift to digital programming that's happened because of the pandemic. We've, all, we've talked a lot already about the staggering number of people with no or limited digital skills. And I think it's very difficult for those for whom digital engagement is as natural as breathing to understand that there are those usually the elderly and the vulnerable, but not exclusively, as we've already mentioned, who are just totally bamboozled by the speed of the shift to digital. Just think about how many things essential to 21st century life can now only be done in the digital universe and not face to face, and then add those which are more easily done online, such as banking, getting the post office to collect a parcel for you, and during the pandemic, basic shopping. This is where public libraries provide an essential service in promoting greater understanding. Through that people's network and the addition of Wi-Fi capability, for over 20 years, public libraries in the UK have been hugely instrumental in providing support to access the world of the internet and advanced communication. And during the pandemic, libraries also massively increased their free ebook and e-audio collections, which for many have been lifelines during lockdown. In fact, they've seen something between a six to 800% uptake in those services, which are also completely free for library users. So in England alone, we have more than 3,000 public library branches and their anchors in the community. The library staff know their communities at grassroots level, as Catherine referred to earlier. During lockdown, on average, many of the staff in library services made 30 to 40 telephone calls per day per service to those who were isolated, vulnerable, shielding and alone and without digital access or skills. In some cases, through those calls, they provide professional support in using technology for the first time for those with devices perhaps given to them by their grandchildren that had never been out of the boxes. Public libraries, as I mentioned earlier, were designated essential services by government and were allowed to remain open if the local authority chose to allow them to do so. And this meant that without access to technology in the home, people could still engage with that health information, employment sites and other essential services during lockdown. Because libraries are safe and trusted spaces where people go to inquire on all topics, which in my experience in the digital context includes issues ranging from really basic requests like I need to create an email account through how do I pay my council tax, my vehicle tax, how do I fill in the recent census form? I need to apply for a secondary school place for my child and it has to be done online and I don't know how to do it. Or I need to apply for universal credit. Can you help me? To can you help me write a CV or do a job application? 
But, and this is again something that's come up in the chat, public libraries are funded through local authorities who are in severe financial difficulty and they're often seen as a target for savings. And this sadly has been the stark reality for over 10 years. And the result is that there are simply not enough staff hours to meet the demand in this area, particularly in more rural and isolated parts of the country. But there is huge potential to unlock that network of library services and to use the existing platform to address this increasingly urgent problem. With more focused resource and using their hardware, software and Wi-Fi provision, as well as the trained expertise of public library professional staff, libraries could deliver even more than they currently do, which is already impressive. Thank you so much for Kat, a super for that Sue, and also for answering a number of questions which were beginning to bubble up, which I was just about to pose. So that was excellent. And I think, um, Thinking around about that sort of public libraries piece, Christopher, if I can pull you in just to sort of think a little bit around about also that sort of student um, population and what some of their experience has been um, when sort of trying to get access to particular areas. Yeah, thanks. And, and I, I'll, I'll make a few comments on there's quite a lot of interesting points coming up on the chat around sort of ac open access and those kind of things, which I think are really really important and, and indeed cost. Um, I mean, just on the pandemic, I mean, a lot of universities didn't close. I mean, there was often this um, sort of perception, wasn't there, that, that universities were closed. A lot of students were not coming onto campus and were learning remotely, but actually a lot of universities stayed open. A lot of staff were there to support those students um, that needed additional support. And there were provisions made in the guidance from government, for example, about particular types of students that could come in um, and use certain facilities and some of that included um, library facilities for particular, and study space facilities particularly for those students who are unable to um, uh, to access those you know in their own home environments or or elsewhere and I think that was an important role that, that universities um, played I guess a, a lot of universities now are thinking about you know libraries as part of that broader question about where where we go now, really, in terms of what we learned from the pandemic, and and um, and I think, as I've already said, there have been a lot of positives from that. And a lot of universities are thinking, well, do we go down this digital first route, which was talked about? And um, but I think there's lots of sort of issues that flow from that, and things, sort of questions and strategic questions that need to be resolved um, about the sort of options and the services that sit around that digital first approach and. And this open access question is a key one. I mean, that will be, you know, we've, I think as someone said in the chat, we've made great strides in that area, but I don't think we've probably made as much progress as, as, as perhaps we could, could make. Um, there's also issues about cost and the cost of the university and what it can afford to, um, uh, to provide in terms of licenses and software and, and those kind of things. And I think some of the sort of big questions about how, the, how those things are procured and negotiated with the publishers and with software providers and licenses and those kind of things come into question. And then I think the other strategic question for universities is the sort of the space. What do you do with the physical space? And I think that, I mean, a lot, as you, I mean, there are probably people here are far more qualified to talk about this than I am, but I sense there was a trend in that direction anyway about rethinking, you know, those spaces that perhaps libraries have once occupied. And I think there's a question about how that is reshaped and remolded to support study space and, and indeed deal with this, some of these questions that we've raised about those people who perhaps don't have access to an options for studying remotely as well. I think just picking up on some of the things you were raising there, and again, we've had a number of questions around about digital skills, and I think they sort of apply both within the universities as well as kind of the sort of public libraries, is that digital skills piece, and how do we provide that training, not just perhaps to students and um, communities, but I think also it's come up a number of times, staff within kind of universities, communities, how do we actually tackle that, that digital literacy skills element and how do we make that a much better experience for everyone so everyone can get access to that type of learning that they need 
I can maybe throw that question open. Is there anyone who would like to kick us off on some thoughts around about that and, and how we can approach it? Sue. This is this is a very small point, but but when I when I went to university um, many moons ago, um, I had to sit a qualification at the time called the use of English, and um, it was it was a completely random qualification that proved that I I just knew how to use the language, and I'm wondering whether actually there is something here for all students to do while they're still in the sixth form at school before they go to university in terms of the kind of digital skills that they're going to be expected to be able to be competent in when they go to university so that 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 transition phase is more e easily managed so that they they get something that, that equips them to go um, before they actually get there because I do think that there is a gap there for a lot of students in terms of the the level of skills that they're able to use when they actually go to university. Thanks for that and Trevor. So I, I think, um, you know, again, going back to, to a point that was raised earlier, we do have staff members um, maybe in the library and certainly across the campus who may not have even been to university and have not developed um, some of the skills about which we are speaking here today. And um, we often have, uh, we make accommodations for, uh, for those staff rather than helping those staff members to develop the skills. So I'm, I'm thinking something very simple, like we're doing an all campus survey and the survey is administered electronically and we will provide a paper survey for those staff who don't have the equipment, um, whose work doesn't normally um, involve the use of equipment on, on campus. Um, and, and, you know, that accommodation, we can argue about the benefits of that, but um, what we, what I think we do have an obligation to help improve those digital skills. Many of us, um, I'm sure Joe would agree, and, and our UK colleagues would as well, um, we do provide instruction in our libraries on the use of on, on digital skills and you know we, we could certainly um, go into a lot of detail about that, but then the commitment from the university and the, the staff, the managers, the administrators, uh, particularly of those staff who may not have those skills, we need to get that support from, uh, from uh, our colleagues and at those levels in order to ensure that the time is available, um, is made available, the paid time is made available um, for those staff members to take advantage of the many resources um, instructional resources that, that, that we provide. So not an answer to the question necessarily, but I think just um, highlighting what uh, one of the major uh, barriers is for uh, increasing that literacy, digital literacy among some of our colleagues. Yes, and I think I sort of saw a comment earlier on in the sort of chat and questions, whether we actually have that data around about who of our staff is actually attending um, digital skills training. Um, so whether we understand who's applying, whether it's just professional staff, whether we're really making our kind of digital skills training really open to all areas of our staff when we're working within universities. There is that assumption, but actually is that an assumption we're making and actually those people who might benefit aren't necessarily seeing it as training or appropriate for them. So I think there is definitely that question and also that question in my mind around about are we collecting the right data in our universities about who's attending this um, and, and maybe we do need to think a little bit more widely around this question of digital skills and literacy in order to make sure that we're much more inclusive and I think we also need to just start thinking a little differently just because staff don't need access to do some of their work day to computers and hardware day to day that doesn't mean that we shouldn't start thinking about ways and means of providing it because that could start shifting and changing what happens in society um, more widely. Joe, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come in, please? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I, I just want to make a comment about um, digital skills training and programs and um, the impact we can or can't have. And I, and I think 
um, you know, all of us uh, at our in our various uh, environments are probably trying to do things that are reaching um, a small portion of the population that really needs to be served or um, uh, invited in to um, the world where we operate comfortably with with digital tools and and information. Um, the, the challenge I see is that those interventions are very narrow and only touch, um, you know, small, sometimes even self-selected groups. And, and I think that the issue, and I, this is going to go back to an earlier point I made, the issue I think for us is, um, can we as institutions um, do things as a sector rather than individually? And can we do things across sectors to begin addressing these problems and to bring some of these resources together, you know, um, we we have engagements with the public schools as a public university uh, in the city of Philadelphia. We have engagements with the city, but we don't have a systematic view or a programmatic um, framework for thinking about the, the fact that this problem does need to be addressed um, more globally. And, and I just, I, I, that's one of the things that, that concerns me is that the, the local programs, which are um, well-motivated and effective in a narrow sense, still don't deal with the larger systemic piece that we really need to be, I think, concerned about. Thanks for that. Catherine? I mean, so based on thinking how we do it in communities, but for the, we just need to embed in digital skills in what we do. We need to, I think, stop seeing it as something separate that needs a separate course or a separate way of dealing with it. We have to embed it in whatever, whatever programs or interventions or teaching we are doing, it has to be a natural part of that and not seen as something, as an add-on. We see that it doesn't work in the community sector in terms of adding it on. And I, I don't see why any reason it should be different here. I think it's about changing our perspective and seeing it as a natural part of whatever we do. Digital skills is embedded as part of that teaching and learning. Now, I have to say, I think I fairly agree with that particular comment, but I think it's so hard to achieve. And I think so many people still sort of see digital skills as something that's sort of slightly separate and off to the side. And I think, again, I was really struck when talking around about digital literacy, people see it as, oh, I know how to use this piece of software or this piece of technology. And actually, you know, the more I work in this area, the more it is just, it's that mindset, it's a sort of aptitude, it's an agility, it's a type of thinking that really needs to kind of come through. And it, it's how do we sort of help people learn that um, and, and kind of bring that to the fore. And I think that's really very challenging. Christopher, what would you like to? Yeah, I was, I was really going to kind of wholeheartedly agree with Catherine's points. I think there's probably things that can be provided separately that, that are optional but I think as uh, I think there's an opportunity because a lot of universities are sort of coming off the back of the pandemic and thinking about their curriculum the sort of pedagogy that underpins that and how they sort of rebuild that in, in a sort of digital context and I think building some of these some of this thinking and some of these skills into the into that framework as it develops I think will be will be will be really important but but also looking at it as part of a sort of whole institutional approach as well that's sort of joined up. So if there are additional modules and options and opportunities that are being provided through, you know, through the library community or other parts of the institution that they, they sort of reinforce that. And then, and then also, I think, not just looking at it in terms of the curriculum either, because I think particularly in relation to students and thinking about disadvantage and opportunity, often that, that that sort of follows a student through their student life cycle and, and is reflected in terms of um, you know student outcomes and employment outcomes as well so so thinking about the kind of skills that would need digital skills that would need to be embedded in terms of taking opportunity of other things that the university is able to offer in terms of you know internships careers advice and support other sort of pastoral support as well that is provided by the by the university out with that sort of core teaching and learning support as well. Thanks for that. And Sue and then Hannah. 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with what um, Catherine was saying, but I think the issue here is that people need different digital skills for different digital things, and and they and and they these are mushrooming. So, for example, I was I was taking part last week in a forum around health literacy and health digital literacy. Um, and there is a move now accelerated by the pandemic for people to have more online consultations with their doctors. But supposing, you know, uh, on that forum was a, a dermatologist who was saying, you know, some people don't have the skills to be able to take a photograph of the skin condition that they're trying to supply, upload it and send it to him for him to have a look at. And when it arrives, it might be blurred and he might not be able to make the diagnosis that he needs to make. And I think, you know, thinking about that, it's about going back to those people who don't have any skills at all and thinking just how terrifying that is. You know, I can't go and see my doctor anymore now. They want me to do this consultation online and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And that, I think, is, is the most fundamental issue that digital poverty needs to address. But with regard to students, I think, again, it's a set of skills that you need to be able to study at university or you need to be competent in, which are above those kind of skills that might be embedded in everyday life. And that's what I was trying to say. You know, I'm, I was it, it, by using the, the, the analogy of the use of English paper I did, I could speak English by the time I was 18. The test I had to do was that I could reproduce that in a forum that was going to be acceptable to the university that I was going to. And I think that's the thing, is actually making sure that all of our citizens are equipped to do the things in, in a digital lifestyle that they need to be able to do. That's the way we, get, we, we, we address digital poverty. Thanks for that, Sue. And before I go to you, Hannah, um, just a couple of questions that have kind of come through the chat, which are very pertinent to the point you were making, that different people need those different skills for very different reasons. And I think um, one of the things that's come emer emerging through the questions is around about postgraduates, which have very different need from undergraduates and have very different sort of challenges that they're facing. And another person on the chat was just kind of raising that issue of mature students coming to learn later on in life may also have very differing digital requirements and different skills that they need to learn. So sorry, Hannah, um, but before we come to your particular area, is there anything that our panelists would like to pick up on that different, different people, different skills piece that we're seeing coming through so strongly? In which case, if we've got nothing further, but everyone in complete agreement that that is absolutely the case. Um, perhaps, Hannah, do you want to come in next? Yeah, I am. Um, I guess it's quite a similar point to what Sue said um, around um, specific skills, but to specific different activities. Um, and the point really is that I think um, we need to make sure that people have the opportunities to be online beyond those specific activities that they need to be able to do. Um, because if you've got less chance to be online to practice your skills generally in other areas, you're going to have a, a less rich experience of being online and your digital literacy is probably not going to be as strong for the specific things that you need it for. Um, which again relates back to the sort of the broader social deprivation. So people who are relying on a data contract um, they might find themselves restricting what they use their data for in case that they find themselves needing something for, for essential things or what they deem to be essential later in the month. And therefore, they're really doing a, sort of less, um, a less rich exploration of what the internet can offer. Um, and then when it comes to the specific activities that they want to be able to use the internet for, they might not be quite as well equipped to do it. No, and I think we're sort of seeing that coming through um, in a range of areas. Sue? Sorry, I just wanted to pick up um, on a, a, something that was in the chat from um, Dr. Purcell, who was saying, um, could the, could the panellists say what two or three tangible things they'd like to see happening um, in order to address these problems? And I'd, I'd like to go back to Joe's 
um, description of the um, of how they were using connectivity, antenna re, re, um, based connectivity. There's a project going on in in the Republic of Ireland at the moment, which is doing precisely that um, with Microsoft in partnership. It's about capturing um, excess connectivity for the, that is um, spilling out of TV connections across the country from mast to mast and harnessing that and putting it into the library network to strengthen that and allow the Wi-Fi to be more accessible. And they're doing that in partnership with um, specific students who are coming from deprived backgrounds. And I think there's a similar project also happening in Chicago as well through the university there. And I think that, that, that in terms of addressing this issue of um, um, you know, public spaces as places where people can go to actually um, access connectivity. I think that's a really big area that we could do more research on to see how that's possible. I would like to see the Wi-Fi network through public libraries strengthened so that if you have a library card, wherever you are in your community, you can plug into your device and use the library services Wi-Fi power to be able to in your home to be able to do that and i don't know how to make those connections and i'd love to see universities look at research panels looking at that to see how we could we could we could strengthen those public wi-fi networks for those who don't have access can't afford access in their own homes through any other means and actually, I think one of our panelists was sort of highlighting that museums are very much also community spaces and, you know, quite often also provide Wi-Fi. So is there something they're working across sectors? So very much echoing what you're saying there, Sue, that we need to kind of look much more widely at public spaces, where are public spaces and where can we start providing those, those access points? And it does also really remind me of the early days of the pandemic when we quite often found our students kind of perched out Outside the library because they could get good Wi-Fi connectivity there and um, kind of download various different elements they needed for their coursework. So I think it is such a crucial part of what we do need to provide. I think I'd just like to um, explore a little bit more that point around about the needs of different users and the needs of our different university users as well. And I wondered whether Joe or Trevor might have any further reflections around about that sort of postgraduate, undergraduate um, requirements and needs. And I think another thing that's coming through very strongly on the sort of um, questioning is also around about universities, sometimes being walled gardens, these research universities, and not necessarily being so open and sharing the kind of resources that they have, how can that be improved? So who might like to um, kick off and, and respond to some of those areas and elements. Joe, can I come to you first? Sure, I'll do my best oh, here. On, I, I, again, I'm gonna um, say, I think that underneath that question, there's a lot of subtleties and complexities about local populations, local groups, and who needs what. And um, our undergraduate student body at my institution is not monolithic. You know, so we have an interesting mix of, you know, middle and upper middle class kids who um, many of whom, of whom come from out of state who are um, relatively uh, well off economically and their needs are different from the needs of the of the student body that comes, um, let's say, uh, from the from the state from the city. Uh, and so what what you know how you achieve coherence and, and you know, what you think the critical needs are is, is one of the challenges. I mean, we do have students who, um, you know, did not have access to, this was, you know, high quality portable computing um, when we went remote and we had to figure out how to get uh, into the hands of those students the tools they needed to complete their, you know, academic work during the course of not only the last year, but through this entire academic year, which we've just finished. And um, there's, there's challenges around self-identification. Who wants to come forward and say, I don't have or can't afford a laptop? Um, we had some very interesting issues with um, just access to, I mean, we've talked about many of these things already, but access to reliable Wi-Fi. We, we um, have in the, the new building we opened 
uh, at Temple uh, about a, um, almost two years ago now, we had a 24 seven study space that we actually closed during the pandemic. And we had some very distressed students because they had nowhere to go at night to get reliable Wi-Fi, you know? And so um, the decisions we made about protecting the general welfare of our community and closing facilities, you know, really severely disadvantaged um, groups of students that had to come forward and speak up because they couldn't do their work otherwise. Um, I, I, I don't want to try and go into the graduate student versus undergraduate student topic because yet yeah, because that's a pretty complicated one about the differences across the population and, and they're, they're not heterogeneous either. So I'll just leave my comments there and see if Trevor has things he wants to add. No, thanks so much for that, Joe. Trevor. Um, but sometimes we make the assumption that graduate students, having been through the undergrad, the, the rigors of an undergraduate education, are digitally literate, and that's not always the case. So um, we do have to think about the ways in which we um, develop our develop and deliver our instructional programs, especially around digital literacy. Um, you know, I, I I concur with everything that that Joe said. You know, I, I don't think any of our institutions have a monolithic student body, whether at the undergraduate or graduate level. Um, and so, trying to develop a program, an instructional program that uh, addresses all the needs at all the times is a challenge for uh, is a challenge for us. Um, and so we try to rely on the instructional program that builds a foundation um, and then uh, encourages our students then to make uh, personal consulta consultation visits if they need additional assistance, either with us in the library or with their faculty member or with our colleagues in IT. Um, and, uh, you know, but we don't know, as Joe said, there may be students not only who don't want to identify that they don't have the equipment, but they also don't want to identify that they don't have the skills, right, uh, or they, they don't have the appropriate, the, the appropriate skills. And so while we can make ourselves available and accessible, um, getting, getting the community or, or students, faculty to, to come into us, and say, hey, I need help with uh, X, Y, or Z. If it's not specifically tied to, you know, my assignment is due at the end of this week and I really have to do uh, whatever the assignment uh, calls for, then, um, you know, that, that, that becomes a real challenge that I'm, I'm not sure, we certainly haven't been able to solve that problem. I'm not sure if anyone has. No, and I think that that's very true. We, we're still sort of struggling with, with a lot of these sort of challenges. And I suppose that brings us to the sort of final part of our discussion. How can we respond as a community, particularly as a kind of library and research library community? And I think I would really welcome also um, Catherine and Hannah, your sort of reflections from the conversation as to how can we as a a research library community do more within this particular space because I think we all acknowledge that it's something that while we've been aware of we perhaps have done some things but we absolutely need to do more especially as we move forward and I think we're all aware you know the current pandemic is yes it's easing off but this situation is going to be with us for a wee while and I think also just acknowledging um, what impact it has on people I think again I'm really sort of reflecting on this lived experience and really sort of realizing what all these things suddenly mean. I've given it a real sort of more of a sense of urgency and sort of tangential kind of or tangible kind of need to do something more about it. So what can we actually do? I think I'd like to, sorry, I know Joe and, and, and Trevor have just spoken, but perhaps sort of if we start thinking around about what's perhaps been happening in the US, what opportunities do you feel that you've had for, collective action and libraries and universities there to sort of do particular things. I think you've both highlighted that there's not a national approach to it, but you know, 
thinking around about your experience, what have you actively been able to do that perhaps we in the UK can learn from and take some inspiration from, and then let's sort of widen this out to the wider panel as well. Um, who would like to kick off? Um, Trevor, do you want uh, to start? Please sure. do. Sure. So, um, you know, Joe referenced earlier that there is not really uh, the type of coordination that um, maybe we would desire or um, that is necessary certainly in, in, in this area or in many areas. Um, and, and so it's, it's the, the lessons that may be learned uh, by our UK colleagues, I'm not sure what those might be. Um, However, you know, we did, uh, many of us, I, I think, did sort of take advantage, if you will, of the past year and um, did provide access um, both to equipment and broadband through mobile devices for, um, for our staff. Um, within our library, we were also able to um, develop some uh, training for uh, a remote training, interestingly, for some of our staff members whose jobs it was, whose jobs were not easily uh, done in a remote environment. And so they were able to take on additional tasks that uh, required the use of some skills that maybe they didn't have or needed to, to be refreshed. Um, and so, so that happened. Um, I, I want to talk also a little bit, though, about the, the sort of public library sector, because that's where I think we see a lot more um, uh, cooperation, if certainly not um, collaboration. So um, there's a universal service that, um, you know, is funded by through the Department of Commerce that provides incentives to, it was a telecommunications act. Um, that provides uh, funding uh, in the old days for telecom, but now for internet services, uh, for public libraries. And the American Library Association, our national association, has been a strong advocate um, for the continuation of the universal services fee that is paid by, uh, paid into by, um, both by the Department of Commerce and also by telecommunications uh, companies. So, you know, we all, many of us will complain about, you know, when we get our telephone bills, there are, you know, myriad fees and we wonder what all these fees are for, but um, a, a portion of these fees at least goes towards um, subsidizing internet access in, in places that uh, would otherwise not have it. Um, President Biden has also been um, going around the country touting his infrastructure plan. And he believes that infrastructure also includes uh, broadband. And so um, there's a Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 that um, will, if passed, provide um, uh, broadband connectivity to tribal areas um, really expand on the broadband infrastructure program that already exists, the, the universal service fee, and, um, and also connecting minority communities um, in ways that they have not uh, had connectivity before. Of course, this is a plan and, you know, has to go through Congress, but, um, you know, the, the, just the idea that um, broadband access is being seen as infrastructure uh, today in ways that it had not been seen before, um, I think is a positive step in, in, in that direction. Um, one of our colleagues in the chat also referenced um, that different states will have different sorts of relationships with, um, you know, the, the, the state education departments or with other, um, other public services uh, organizations, and we are one such state, so the University of Delaware provides um, database access to the entire kindergarten through secondary education population in the state. We're a small state, we can do that. Um, um, but not only do we provide that access, our librarians um, travel around the state to provide instruction 
Um, you know, this is very focused instruction on the use of databases, but it is a component of the digital literacy skills that our kindergarten through secondary education students um, do need uh, to help them be better prepared for college or whatever it is that comes um, for them after the, at the end of their secondary educate, their, their 10 years of secondary education student. So there, 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 are, there are some ways in which, um, there are some coordinated ways in which um, higher education libraries are working um, both with other higher education institutions or with um, state or local institutions to, to help uh, bridge the, the digital divide, a phrase that was very popular here some time ago. But, um, but the, the broader efforts uh, of collaboration and coordination, I think are still um, lacking. Thank you for that. Now, Joe. Um, well, I'll add a few things um, that I think are related to, to Trevor's um, comments. First of all, I, 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 you know, Trevor, Trevor mentioned earlier the sort of, um, I think raised consciousness of, of um, anti-racism that is is in the environment right now to, to some degree for us. And, and we've lived in a, as you all know, and probably have also experienced in your own domains of a highly fraught political environment for, for the last uh, number of years. But I think that the combination of the, in the United States of the pandemic and the, um, the deepened awareness of the, continuing pervasiveness of, of racism in our, in our society and culture have provided a moment of opening for civic, civic engagement by universities, um, especially public universities in their communities. And I think that, um, and I think if, if we're intentional about um, how to take that opening and mobilize um, some of our resources to do more work um, for communities um, with historically unaddressed needs, we can begin to um, maybe have broader impacts on some of these questions of, of digital equity. And, and so the second point I wanna make is, and this kind of follows from some of the comments that, that uh, Trevor made, is there's actually also embedded in, this, in the most recent um, relief legislation that came out of the Biden administration, a, um, the largest allocation of money to public libraries that's come um, to the states in, in a well over a generation. And in Pennsylvania, um, there is a cross sector conversation between academic libraries and public libraries going on. I'm actually gonna be in a meeting this afternoon, in fact, about this, um, about how we might use that money that's come to Pennsylvania, and it's a substantial amount of money, it's multi-millions of dollars to the state library um, in the context of digital equity. So I think that there's an opening around these um, challenges in this moment that we have to have the courage to respond to, and we have to be pretty imaginative and pretty creative and, and, and think about whether or not we can do some more systemic things um, that build on the local work we've done. Because I do think this, this moment of civic engagement is real. It's intensely felt by university administrators. Um, and um, it, it, it creates uh, an opportunity for research libraries and academic libraries and public libraries potentially. Um, and okay, let's include museums and other kind of public facing public good enterprises to come together and think about what, you know, what the systemic framework might be for doing some of this work. And, and I'm not sure what we'll accomplish out of it, but I hope we accomplish much more than we've done over the last you know, decade. So thank you for those reflections, Joe. And Catherine, you wanted to respond to some of those. Yeah, I mean, it, it's building on what Trevor Anja has said. Um, and it goes back a little bit what I said about uh, an eco, um, a digital ecosystem, but actually the scale of the problem is that none of us working on our own is going to solve this. And it's um, not, it is about public libraries, research libraries, higher education, but also the community sector, because they are very much doing an awful lot of this work. And I'm seeing through the chat people saying things like, oh, well, we can't get access to some of the basic digital skills. 
Well, maybe or our staffing, you know, is, is related to funded students, you know, broadening our offer is going to be challenging for us. Well, actually, could could some of these other organizations pick some of this up? You know, can we not work together to look at this? And in one tangible thing, and I'll, I'll put the link after in a minute, is that we have established now a data poverty lab. And this is going to be want it to be a collaboration with private public and community sector organizations to really look at this data poverty piece. And so there's a link on that and we're encouraging people to sign up. I have no, I can't see any reason why any of you guys cannot sign up and be part of this conversation and to be part of the solution. But I do think the answer is looking at our communities and looking at, you know, who is on our doorstep you know, not just the public library, but actually, is there another organization that's down the road that also we can be working with and thinking, and again, linking what Sue was saying about linking the Wi-Fi together. So, you know, can any of our Wi-Fi be broadened out more so that we can actually support some of the local community in our area that are around our institutions? Can that then, if the local library goes to this point, you know, let's really think about this in a coordinated approach. It isn't easy which is why it's not happened before but if we don't use the momentum of what has happened with the pandemic and the fact that at the moment if we don't do it now we're never going to do it I don't think so let's use this let's turn what has been a really negative thing we've got to turn this around and we can only do it by working together and you know we're always more than interested in talking to lots of different organizations and we were you know we're talking to so we're working with so we're trying to find ways in which we can bring this all together but it would be great to bring in the research and the higher education into that conversation too. No, and I think there's a great kind of um, question from the chat around about that potential for a sort of sectoral approach from libraries across the whole UK higher education. And I know Sue's got a hand up to kind of pop in, but you know, it is that, how do we create that cross sectoral library partnership, that community practice? How do we sort of link across? And we are seeing some areas of good practice where research libraries are working more closely with public libraries, but it is perhaps just rethinking, thinking at the box, looking at new ways and working with our sort of sector organizations like Philip and Sconnell and so on to kind of start thinking a bit more about what can we practically do and how can we move forward. And I think you're right, if we don't tackle it now, we're never ever going to really sort of engage with this. But Sue, do you want to come in as well? Yeah, I, I'm just to say absolutely endorse everything that Catherine said, and I think actually you're right, Kirsty. Um, out of out of turbulence comes change, and we've just gone through just about the most turbulent year that we ever have. It's put the strongest lens on this pro on this problem that that we're ever likely to get. And if we can't mobilise reaction to sort this out, I think we have a big problem. I've put something in the chat about a part um, a piece of work we did a couple of years ago about partnership working between public libraries and higher education and and perhaps just to say that in in the UK to, to draw attention to um, the the knowledge exchange framework and the research excellent framework which which and on top of which, I was asked to go and speak about how universities could connect better with their communities in order to fulfil the remit of those two frameworks. And I think that that kind of um, the development of partnerships between public libraries and university libraries and health libraries and, and as you say, the professional organisations, Sconnell and Philip, um, and other organisations that are interested in this within the UK is how it, it, it's not just in this form, it's about lots of different areas that, that they can work in partnership to deliver a better community experience and and somebody I think I can't remember who said something about the universities being in a little sort of garden locked away garden that actually that about bringing those those people together for all kinds of reasons not just around digital poverty is only going to be beneficial I think and we're not good enough at partnership working I think or about horizon scanning about where those partnerships might be every time we want to do something no, oh, I would absolutely agree with that. We do just need to rethink and do so much more. Hannah? Yeah, I just sort of wanted to echo that idea that the, the momentum's really sort of building on this issue at the moment. Um, because obviously people are only excluded insofar as they're missing out on what their peers who are online can get access to. 
So I think it's really obviously been exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, and within my research, we're seeing that um, some people who maybe didn't previously see a real need to be online or real motivation um, are now sometimes sort of realising the benefits of being online and wanting to get involved in that. So for both individuals who are digitally excluded at the moment um, and also on a societal level, I think it's um, re increasingly recognised as a pressing issue, a pressing issue that could be um, sort of built upon. Um, and obviously, I think this idea of sort of working together cross sectoral is really important. Um, relating back again to this relationship between deprivation more broadly and digital exclusion. So, um, for example, with housing, housing inequality is, is quite an important factor. Um, so in my research, it's become quite clear that living in certain forms of temporary housing makes it really hard to get Wi-Fi. Um, or in situations where people live in sort of one room accommodation, get, actually getting space to sit down and learn how to use a computer properly can be really challenging. Um, and that's something that it's very hard to see how one organisation or institution could tackle that. Um, so it's something that really needs a, a more holistic approach, I think. No, and I really agree. And I think just even reflecting on having sort of conversations with my kids' teachers who were suddenly going, you know, I don't normally engage with digital because I can do everything, you know, in this particular format, but now suddenly I have to know how to use Teams. And actually that's quite scary, but suddenly them understanding actually why this might be good and then sort of having an appreciation actually of what skills kids might need and then that sort of linking to oh there are jobs and different sectors for which this could be quite critical so I think it's been that real realization that sort of kicked through quite a lot of different things and I think again in universities we've got a particular role to play around about those digital skills and Christopher if I could maybe bring you back in again. Yes yeah sure um I think the um... I mean, it's interesting the walled garden analogy. I think I think it's changing, um, and I think that things are being put in place to incentivise that and encourage that change. I mean, we I was up in well, it was pre-pandemic, but I was up in Derby, and the university runs a bus service. Um, you know, quite an extensive bus service actually around the region to bring people in from rural areas. To study but also that's available to the community and you know Northampton's fantastic example of a, a university that has social enterprise that underpins what it does it runs all sorts of sort of aspects of public service in that locality so I think there are examples that you know universities are, are they provide sort of legal services to to the community they run museums they're doing all sorts of things so I think there's something about just continuing to incentivize and develop that and making sure that digital poverty piece is built into that um, and then I think the, the second aspect of it I think is um, you know universities are required uh, for those colleagues in the states by our regulator which in England which is the office for students to spend money that comes from the fee that students pay on access and participation so to make sure that people from disadvantaged groups uh, get access to universities and it's about it's about a billion pounds per year spent. And I think there's something about making sure that digital poverty and understanding digital poverty is built into what universities are doing through the money that they're spending around access and participation as well. It's not only just making sure that they're spending that money, but also that that's underpinned by an understanding of what works as well. And that's what we're trying to um, build into how universities are thinking about the investments they're making in that area through um, there's a new what works center for example that's been set up around access and participation you know universities might send thousands of kids off on summer camps each year um, but no one really knew whether that made any difference whatsoever so you know through randomized trials and various other tools behavior insights that kind of thing universities are getting more sophisticated at understanding what works so i think we've got to build that sort of approach into understanding digital poverty and how we address digital poverty, particularly as it relates to access and participation and, and students. And then the third bit, and, and, and maybe this is just me sort of feeling sort of, uh, you know, good about what we're doing in the UK, but we also have you know, some of these questions about coordination um, in the UK are probably a little bit easier, I think. Um, and we of course have JISC, which is that sort of UK wide national body and we have the professional organizations as well, like Sconnell and, 
and RL UK that I think can support people to coordinate and bring some of these things together. And I mean, just does a great job. And, and often, you know, people don't see some of the stuff it does around procurement, coordinating negotiations around open access and with publishers and copyright license holders and those kind of things. So I think, um, I think sort of strengthening and supporting those kind of roles will be important to get that join up in that coordination as well. So thank you so much for that. And we've had someone join our panel. So Rachel, if you would like to pose your question, please. And have we just lost Rachel? Is this our first technical blip? It is indeed. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> well, rather than Rachel joining our panel, um, we will move on to, I think, a sort of final question um, that we've got, which is, come from Mark Purcell. And I think Sue, you'd kind of sort of spotted this one, but Mark was sort of really asking what two or three tangible things um, could research libraries do to help address digital poverty? And I thought that was such a great question that I might just kind of go around all of you um, and say, you know, if, if there are two things you think research libraries should do, um, what do you think we should be doing more of? And um, perhaps if I could start with you on this one, Catherine. Um, so a couple of things that research libraries could help do to address digital poverty? Uh, so one, um, join the di digital poverty collaboration that I've just put in the network, uh, in the chat panel um, and be part of that conversation. And I think the second is to look on something like the online centers network or and have a look where are your local um, provisions for digital inclusion around your area that perhaps you could start to build some connections or links with, whether that's about um, if you're unable to support some of the students with their digital needs, you know, could you direct them to there as part of that? Or is there something more about building a, that, starting to build that sort of collaboration in your local area? I think that would be my two, two things. Thank you. Sue, you next. Yeah, I think I, I would definitely say it's about building the partnerships to look at this in a holistic way. But also to go back to what I said earlier, I'd like to see somebody looking at the science of all this. You know, how, how can we harness the resources that we have for the benefit of all? How can we turn um, uh, connectivity into a utility? Great, thank you. And Hannah, next, what are your reflections as to what we could do? Yeah, I would echo again, making those community links and maybe also something to do with skills um, rather than assuming a basic level of skills, making sure that um, that skills support is there even in a very basic way. Brilliant, thanks. And, and the US perspective on, on what we could do in the UK, Joe and then Trevor. Well, again, I'm going to say, um, you know, what others have said. I do think the um, partnerships with um, civic entities, government, and the public library sector with, um, you know, looking both at our local communities where we're geographically located and then more programmatically across what, what we can do um, collectively. That's that's one thing. I think another thing is, is um, Trevor was talking about this a little bit earlier, how we create inclusive um, outreach and educational programs that um, destigmatize uh, for those who don't have either the skills or the resources, um, the path toward acquiring those things, both in terms of hardware and in terms of skills. I think creating an environment that really looks at inclusion as a framework that makes people, that supports um, being comfortable um, getting access to the things that, you know, lack of them uh, is also a lack of social capital. So you're going, you're dealing with that hurdle around, um, you know, that, that sort of the personal embarrassment and figuring out what we can do programmatically there, I think also matters for our students. Thank you so much. And Trevor? Um, so I will echo everything that's been said before. Certainly the, the partnerships are, are extremely critical, a, a very critical component of, um, of this work. So partnering with our public libraries, with the other civic um, uh, organizations, 
um, whether locally, nationally, or, or globally. And, um, and then uh, making sure one of the things that we've been extremely good at, and I think in academic libraries, is our instructional uh, programs. And so, um, but making sure that those programs are accessible in the ways that uh, Joe just referenced and, and try to destigmatize um, the need to, uh, for, for those who need the help um, to seek it. And Christopher, what can we do? Yeah, I think my two things would be, because I'll come back to point I made just now really, be led by the evidence and, and what works. Um, I think people can spend a lot of time and effort doing things, but, but, um, but it's important to understand you know, it's going to have an impact and you're using your time and resources effectively. And there is a lot of evidence and um, information out there that could be used. And then the other, um, the other one would be, would be to really support the points that have been made around partnership and collaboration. Um, but probably from a university perspective, for those research libraries embedded within universities, I think it's, um, it's about joining up within your own institution as much as anything as well, because um, universities are are, as I've said, are doing a lot more generally in terms of their sort of strategies towards that civic engagement. Um, so, so making sure it's it's kind of joined up in that whole institutional approach. 